Happy March, I guess. <laughs> Mother Nature is uh, trying to decide if it's going to be springtime yet. Um, anybody, let's open the service tonight with any prayer requests or testimonies. Anybody have anything? Anything? Yes. Well, I um, was blessed again this, uh, this, last, this last week. Um, all of our raises got approved by the president of the company. Uh, so it was kind of nice. And then all the, uh, the bonuses actually got approved. Um, even though we had down sectors in different parts of the, of the United States for some of the other companies, um, we did well in the morning, so we were greatly rewarded. So praise the Lord. Thank you for it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, I we need to continue praying for Tim. He's still struggling with some of the things at work and disappointments and different things like that that we probably all the time aware of because some of the requests in the past. Peter, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? Tim. Sorry, Tim. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Peter. Yes, I uh, uh, want to thank the Lord. I uh, we started a new class that uh, uh, I'm in the classroom, and, and each class is on personal. But I, I was just thankful for the Lord that uh, it's been quite a few years ago now since I started teaching the class. But I've discovered that the best the, the way the class turns around is when I get in there early in the morning and pray over. Every chair in there and ask God to be in there. I mean, it just, it's amazing how that just settles everything down and makes the classroom flow. You know, I didn't used to do that in the early years and you get different personalities in there, but it just seems like it's just like God is in the room and He brings so much peace yeah. and, and it makes the teaching so much easier and, and they soak it up a lot, a lot better because I always felt that. You know, it's, it's like 10% of the material and 90% of investment in them and changing life. Yeah. You know, and that's what I see because a lot of times when they feel comfortable with you, because some of them haven't been in school for, you know, 30 years, it's not like they come out of high school and go come to us. So a lot of them have, you know, come from different jobs. But when they feel comfortable and then they can open up about, you know, personal, just things that happen in their life. Feel that some of them feel you know are actually a praying man, or mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that to me is just so incredible mm -hmm. when they ask that and say, hey, you know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for those situations in your life, and so I'm just thankful for that opportunity. Amen. And um, I just want to ask prayer for a client that um, we were there for a bond sale and. They were discussing the renewal of his contract, and this is a man who had made great strides in the school district as a superintendent, and uh, was a godly man. Has changed the culture of that whole school district, where the teachers go, they look the kids in the eyes, they greet them, they welcome them to the classroom, making a real difference in these kids' lives. And some of the changes, people, some, sometimes changes is hard. And anyway, I would just like to pray that whatever the scuttle is with the school board, there's a few new members I think that have an agenda. Um, I believe he was placed there by God in that district, and I want to see him stay. And even though I can't say anything to school board meeting because of my position, my professional position, I can certainly pray for him tonight here with all of us. Um, Bob Callahan is his name. He's He's been a real blessing professionally for me. Um, they had, anyway, I, I can go on and on, but he's a, he's, a, he's a man of God, and he's a believer, and he's making a difference in the kids' lives in the district he serves, and I would like to see his contract extended because I don't believe his work that God sent him there to do is done. In Jesus' name. Yes, sir. But um, I've been going through a lot of like inner stuff, not like turmoil or stress, but like inner like heart stuff with God. And I've been going back and forth a little bit with this. And, um, you know, Eric and I have talked about some things and he has 
you know, God's used Eric to come tell me some things that I need to hear, not like chastising me or anything like that, but just to look at something from a different point of view and, um, you know, like I was talking about last week about how we are new, we, you know, why, you know, it's, for me especially, why don't I act new, why don't, why am I not who I was created to be, why do I dig my heels in the dirt, <laughs> you know, when something new comes up, um, but I was, I got the opportunity to talk to two friends today, and they're very close, very dear friends, and we're the kind of friends where we can not talk for a really long time, but we just pick right back up the, you know, the, the next time we do talk. And um, it was really nice because they're both, they're both women of, of God, and so that's nice because I can freely say what I need to say and kind of what I'm going through, and, and um, I just feel really, you know, thankful for that, that I have that, that I have that kind of release of trusted people that are going to give me wise counsel, um, because that's what a, that's one of the things a friend does is you know, they give very wise counsel, and so that was really really nice. But it it kind of brought me to a, a, a new space again, which is great because usually, like I said, I, I dig my heels in the dirt and I don't want to change, and I I'm I'm adamant I'm not going to, and this is just the way it's going to be, and so. Um, I'm just real thankful that God's been kind of just changing my perspective lately and the way that instead of the way I'm going to see it or the way I want to see it, I'm starting to see things the way I believe he wants me to see situations and people, you know, the way, you know, that, that he would see them. And, and one of the women I was talking to, she, she said something to me about, how one of the best things about me that she loves the most about me is that I'm not afraid to say what needs to be said. And, she, you know, I, I have never looked at it from that perspective before. I thought I was just bossy, you know? <laughs> but uh, it turns out that I'm, I'm better than bossy. So um, she, she said, you know, Sarah, she says, that's just one thing I've always admired about you is just your courage to just say what needs to be said. And to like just stand up when you need to stand up and you know I I had this very fast flashback you know like we had flashbacks about, you know from our when we were children all the way to the point where we are now and, and um, it's like a million memories in like two seconds and you know when I grew up in my childhood in the way that I grew up with my family and um, you know I was bossed around a lot and I had to stand up I had to be very decisive as to when I was going to stand up, because when I did stand up, it better be for something important, because the consequences were going to be huge. <laughs> I mean, they were going to be huge. My mom did not play around. I mean, she did not play. It was her way, or it was no way. So, and I, you know, I, I always remember never being mad at her, because I always said, she just doesn't know. And having that attitude really grew very young in life, I think, has helped me now because I still kind of have that attitude. But my friend said to me, she said, Sarah, even you tell me, Jane, calm down. You need to take these people where they're at. Take them where they're at. Take them where they're at. And, you know, it just, it was amazing to me that that's the thing that she loves the most about me, you know, and it just, it just made me really thankful for all of my trials and my tribulations and, and the, the good that went along with all of the bad because that has brought me to where I am right now. And where I want to be is I want to be where God wants me to be. You know, I want to be whole and I want to be healed and I don't want to be heartbroken anymore. And, you know, I don't want to be any of those things. Whereas before I just thought, oh, I'll just shove it down a little bit further and we'll just forget it's here and there. And then it, you know, erupts back up again. But I don't want to do that. I want it. I want it out. I want to be purged of all of this. Yeah. And so it's just been, just it's just been, it's been wild because since last, since Sunday, I mean, that's three days ago, you know, God has, has been showing me these things every single day, every single day. And, you know, I'm sure he always was showing me these things every single day. However, 
my perspective is changing, so now I'm seeing them. And I know that a big part of that is being here and being a part of what's going on here. And this is just like, this family is so important to me, and I'm so thankful for this family because this family is what I've always wanted but never knew where to find or how to create or how to even be a part of it. You know, but when, since the first day that I walked in, I was a family member. You know, I was a family member. I was treated like a family member. It was very weird for me. I'm not going to lie. It was very weird because I'm not used to being like, oh, you know. And, and so I've evolved in like the, the last year and a half, two years that I've been here. And so I'm just very thankful for all of you for just, you know, taking me where I was at and showing me that that's what love is because that's, that's what I needed the most was I needed love. You guys gave it to me. You are very loved, sir. <laughs> yes, same. Um, I mean, I'm thankful that they had a good, uh, even when you do so, the work that they have two people that they were kind of short of. Brother Peter, Lord, we lift him up to you right now, Lord. Yes, Lord, and that you make the way, light the way before him, that he might walk in it, Lord. Give him divine wisdom, divine favor. Yes, Lord, to step out in faith, Lord, into the unseen, Lord. Yes, Lord, we pray for Tim's students, Lord, and as he teaches and leads and guides them more in just the learning in the school, Lord. The learning in life and learning that they are precious, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan for each of them. Bless them, Lord. Thank you for bringing Sarah into this family, Lord. We thank you that you are transforming her, Lord, from glory to glory. I thank you, Lord, that you are transforming each of us from glory to glory, Lord. We pray for James tonight, Lord, and his Joe and his roommate situation, Lord. You have your way, Lord, and bless them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your favor, Lord. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for showing us and teaching us who we are, who we are as a new creation, Lord. The authority that you've given us, the keys that you have given us, Lord. That you are the key, Lord. That you are the door, Lord. That you have made the way that you have finished it, Lord, that we might simply walk in it and put our hope and our trust in you, Lord. Help us to put a watch over our mouth, Lord, and the words that we speak, Lord. Let our words bring forth life. Let our words bring forth love and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Let us be beacons of hope in this world that is so dark and so angry and so lost and so hurt, Lord. A beacon of hope, Lord, sharing the good news 
that it is finished, that you loved us so much that you gave everything, Lord. And as we gather tonight, Lord, we lift our eyes and our hearts to you. Have your way in this service as we worship you, Lord. As we receive your word, as we feast on your word, let our minds be renewed and transformed to understand who you are and what you have accomplished and who we are. Jesus, you are so good. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the abundant life that you have called us to. More than enough. A life of more than enough. If we will just believe. A reminder again, uh, we are looking for help in this sound booth. Uh, Eastern Gate, this Friday. Friday night, uh, yeah, we're going to find the loose. This pastor was preaching on Sunday. Um, uh, Tim was talking about praying over classroom situation before uh, the gathering and stuff like that. Well, the revelation I got that Pastor expanded on Sunday. Uh, happened Monday morning, the previous Monday, while I was praying, walking through an empty warehouse over to throw that thing, and then it seemed like the situation was as I was releasing the kingdom in that place, the Lord said, I want to show you something, and pour it back in, so we can't count the guys in the summer. So, anyway, we're going to take some keys, we're going to, yeah, lose things, but we're going to buy some stuff. We've got a lot of, of junk to be wrapped up for the way. All right, and just a reminder also, uh, this Sunday is Spring Forward. So just a reminder to set your clocks, don't be late. We will be here at 10 a.m. Central. Uh, will it be standard time on Sunday? Daylight. It'll be daylight time. Yeah. So yeah. it really feel like 9. It really felt like nine. So you'll be here yeah. Yeah. So we'll be here today. <laughs> it's gonna be ugly, but I'll be here. <laughs> so just a reminder. Michael has been reminding me a lot. Not much of a morning person. All right, um, Tim, do you want to come take an offering for us tonight, please?
God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your sweet presence, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your long-suffering and patience with us, Lord. We just bless your name tonight, Lord. We lift you up and magnify you, Lord. We bless the Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. you may be seated. And uh, thank you, Mike and worship team. I was thinking while we were worshiping, I came to my mind to pray for our uh, pastor's wife. And uh, she's had some health issues, and they've had a, a major setback. That you know, in East Texas, they had some terrible floods here in the last year, and they basically lost everything. And uh, so. Back, they're the same age we are, in fact, and uh, so it's, you know, starting all over at, it's not easy, you know, and uh, and I know she's uh, battling some real uh, spiritual battles over her health as well as the, the situation, and sometimes it's hard, if people forget that I think that uh, preachers and pastors are no different than everybody else. They, you know, they have the same battles, they have the same struggles and challenges to their faith. And and they've they've been so good to us over the years. I mean, we've known them for what 35 years or more. And uh, they were they helped us in so many ways when we first got in the church and and uh, encouraged us, helped us uh, in the ministry and so on and so forth. And, I've been good friends of ours, even though we may differ in some areas of doctrine, uh, we still believe in Jesus is the only answer, praise the Lord, and we agree on the things that are most important, amen, and uh, and we really do love them, and they've been uh, shown their love to us over the years as well, so uh, Sally was texting back, or I don't texting and back and forth and stuff yesterday, and so I know she's in a real battle right now. So I'd like us all to just stand and go to the Lord in prayer again for Elaine and uh, Bobby Edwards and just believe for a, a great breakthrough yes, in every area of their life yes, and in the situation. They've been faithful to the Lord for so many years and I know God wants to really bless them. So, Father, we just come before you right now with uh, the knowing the love that you have for your children. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would just pour that out on, on Bobby and Elaine Edwards, that they would just experience a massive breakthrough in every area of their life, that healing would flow, that breakthroughs in finances and uh, uh, rebuilding their homes and all the things that uh, they're struggling with, Lord. Show yourself mighty on their behalf. You've been a faithful God to them for so many years, and Lord, we know that you nothing has changed with you. And we just ask, Lord, that they would see a real and a powerful manifestation of your life in them and in their situation. And, Lord, we're giving you thanks for it right now. We declare that it is done in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for showing yourself mighty on their behalf. We give you all the praise and all the glory. For you are a great and a mighty God, the only true and living God. And for that, Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much for praying with us. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good. Praise the Lord. I kind of struggled with what I was going to preach tonight. Not that I didn't have something, but just what it was going to be. And I going in different directions. Sometimes when you know certain things, you, your your natural mind kind of wants to take you that direction, even if it isn't, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't want to do that. I just want to do what I feel like the Lord is, is talking to me about. Praise the Lord. But before I get into that too far, it would be uh, <clears throat> remiss of me if I didn't tell you that yesterday I saw a guy spill all of his Scrabble letters on the road you say Scrabble letters. Yeah, he spilled the ball on the road. And I asked him, what's the word on the street? <laughs> oh, he lightened up a little bit. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's not going away. 
It happened. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, the Lord has a great sense of humor. Praise the Lord. Obviously. <laughs> Look around. Amen. All right. Well, let's, getting aside, let's get right to it. Amen. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Y'all know that uh, when we get born again, we're born of the Spirit, and our spirits are made brand new, restored to fellowship with God, reconciled to God, redeemed to the Lord. But you don't have to be saved very long before you realize this didn't get saved. It has to be renewed. And so there is a battle, and uh, I know there's... You know, there's sometimes arguments within the body of Christ over whether we have two natures or if that old nature was destroyed and so on and so forth. I won't even go there because I don't know for sure what they're, if that's just semantics or what it is they're actually saying. But I do know this. We have problems with this sometimes. And this thing can cause us to say things and do things that don't agree with our spirit whatsoever. So in a roundabout way, that's kind of what I want to talk to you about tonight because we all have battles. And... Uh, Nobody's exempt from this because we're on this planet and we have flesh, we have a natural mind, and uh, so we, we battle with things and sometimes the enemy comes and tells you, well, you're not even saved. I mean, how, how could you say something like that? How could you do something like that? How could you behave that way? Well, my spirit doesn't. It's perfect. But this thing here can cause me to say and do things that I don't really, that my spirit doesn't agree with at all. That's the Adamic kind of side of us that has to be renewed, that has to be transformed and uh, conformed, amen, to Jesus Christ, not to this world. So, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that is resurrection faith. And that's what we really have to have. It's not enough to just have a mental acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, but it's that not only was he crucified and buried, but he rose from the dead. That's the faith, amen, that challenges us. We were raised with him, amen, in newness of life. So look at John chapter 20 now. <clears throat> Excuse me, John 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So John's saying that he, he, he wrote this gospel not just so that, that we would understand or not just so that we would be convinced or, or informed. He wrote it so that we would believe with a life-giving effort, with a born again effort amen with a resurrection life kind of effort praise the lord he wrote so that uh, we take the power of the cross and be born again into a life with the quality of resurrection um, does that make sense praise the lord so that we wouldn't just be better humans we would live a resurrected life and truly be a new creature in christ that's the battle that's what, we're all, that's what we all struggle with, praise the Lord. Look at Romans now, uh, verse 8, or excuse me, chapter 8 and verse 11. And we touched on some of these scriptures, uh, excuse me, Sunday, but this is a little bit different context that I'm speaking to you about this evening. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. So, if we've been born again, we have the Spirit of God in us. And that Spirit of God that's in us will make alive, amen, our natural man. It'll, it'll, make it, it'll help to bring it into agreement, amen, with who we really are. And that's the battle. The resurrection power, see, it's not, it's not the sort of thing that is content to just settle in your mind. It's not content to just give you religious kind of ways of looking at life and, and, and dealing with life. It is a power that gives new life. Praise the Lord. Kingdom life. A life that resonates or vibrates, if you will, with the eternal quality of resurrection. All new. All different. Amen. Completely 
unlike anything that we've ever experienced before. The resurrection gospel is <clears throat> truly a full gospel. It's the whole thing. It's the truth of it. Amen. And what the church in general or what religion uh, have made us accustomed to is this kind of simplistic, stripped down gospel. A gospel that suggests that, well, okay, you have issues, but Jesus died for you. Now just be a good person. Praise the Lord. Well, the full gospel, the resurrection gospel, amen, says your problem is a radical one. Amen. No less serious than death itself. Praise the Lord. And it requires a radical intervention, nothing less powerful than resurrection. This is what Sarah was talking about. All of us, she, she just put it into words, but all of us deal with this. Yes. And no matter how long you've been saved, we're, we're still not, we're like Paul. I press toward the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived. I'm not where I was, thank God, but I haven't totally come to a full revelation and understanding of this. And this is all that I've been preaching about for the last couple months. And I, that's why I say that grace is so, so important because you, without that, you can't get to where it is God's trying to get us to. Praise the Lord. So the full gospel says that the level and the quality of your messed upness is complete, exhaustive, irreconcilable by you. But the gift of God's grace extends infinitely, inter eternally, covering everything. Praise the Lord. It reconciles us to completely be one with God in a way that you can only describe as bringing a dead person back to life. Praise the Lord. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. To make it any less than that, and that's what happens with religion. It's just kind of a fixed up corpse, and now be good. It doesn't take you very long to figure out it's hard to just be good on your own. Right. To just try to be a better you, praise the Lord. So what that really means for us is our focus, our understanding of salvation turns from what we've been saved from to what we've been saved to. Because exactly. the enemy always wants you to take you back. Praise the Lord. Make that the priority. All right. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. And we shouldn't be ashamed. We're not bragging about our failures. We're not focusing on our failures. But we shouldn't be ashamed to be able to share that with one another because that's how we grow. That's how, that's how we are encouraged to know that I'm not the only messed up one. Praise the Lord. We're all messed up. Praise God. In fact, we had to die in order to escape it. Right. Praise the Lord. So according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence and understanding, having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He has purposed in Himself. Praise the Lord. So He chose us before the world was created. He chose us to be adopted into His family. So we not only have forgiveness but the key to unlock the mystery of God's will. Again, what Sarah was talking about tonight. And all of us think these things. We're all trying to figure out what is God saying? How is how's He trying to reveal Himself? How is He trying to show Himself to me and through me and so on and so forth? Amen. It's the mystery of God's will is being in Christ. The power of resurrection. And for that you have to understand grace. Because if you don't understand grace, you'll never be able to accept the fact that God has accepted you. Because we're still dealing with that old thing. Because it's still here. Just as we've said. I don't want to belabor this, but we all got memories. We all have issues. We all have stuff that comes from our past and flashbacks. And, it, and sometimes we don't even recognize it as a flashback. We just, it's a reaction to somebody else that has nothing to do with somebody else. It's just something that comes out of us because of who God only knows, something that took place 
50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, whatever. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We were broken images of God. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Adam was created in the image of God. He fell. We became broken images from that point on. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, in the place of Jesus, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. It's a revealing of his life and his nature in each one of us. That's what this is all about. Mark 16 verses 15 through 18. Familiar, we quote this all the time, and, uh, but I think it helps us to kind of look at it and see why we're not consistent in this and why we don't see these manifestations. Amen. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that, is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, I believe in water baptism, but that isn't specifically what he's talking about. He's talking about being baptized into Christ. Water baptism is simply a type of that, and the Scripture actually says nobody gets saved by baptism alone. If, if you don't understand that we are baptized into Christ when we're born again, then water baptism isn't going to make a bit of difference. It's just going to be a wet center coming up, you know, a dry center coming up wet. So that's what he's talking about. Baptism is a type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's why we do it. You, you're dead, you go down, you're buried, and you come up, it's resurrection life. That's what it's representing. Amen. That's what happens when we get born again in Christ. We partake of His death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. We've been set free from the bondage of corruption, death. Amen. We've already died and been made alive again. Resurrection is so that we can begin to operate in the nature of Christ, alive to God. That's what he's talking about here is resurrection life. And if we're not aware of this, if we've dumbed it down to some religious kind of activity, then it's not any great wonder that we're not laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover, that we're not casting out demons, that we're not still having all the issues, amen, that we had before we were born again, before we were reconciled, amen. We've been set free, amen. So, praise the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. We are now alive to God. Alive with God life. Amen. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So remember, he said, remember what I told you, I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what is withholding the revealing of Jesus. What's holding back the revelation, the revealing of Him in our lives. Okay? The He that is to be revealed is the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back, if you will, Mike, to verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and, be, and by our gathering together unto Him. That's the context that, he, that He's speaking of here. So then He goes on after this and He talks about the man of sin. Uh, verses 3 through 6. And we can look at them just for the sake of keeping everybody together here. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And then he's talking about the, re the revealing. Is Jesus what's withholding the revealing? This other revealing. Praise the Lord. So, Second Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7. Know ye not that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is the second half of a mystery. Now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the second half. The first half of the mystery is Colossians 1, 26 and 27, which is Christ in you. Okay, so now you know that, okay, if, if you can go there, Colossians 1, 26 and 27, even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, so resurrection life. Right? The Spirit of God in you. The flip side of the mystery is the iniqu iniquity is already at work. Amen? Romans 8 and 1. So the mystery, we are in Christ, but the flip side of that mystery is iniquity is at work. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So there's, there's positionally, we are in Christ. We can still sin, but we're not sinners anymore. But here's what he's saying. You can be in the Spirit and still, in other words, you can be positioned in Christ, be born again, and still walk after the flesh. That's part of the struggle. That's this, that's this double-sided coin. Christ in you, the hope of glory, amen, and the iniquity that's at work. Right. Praise God. So there is this, I don't know how, let's see, soul life or spirit life. Soul life is a lack of identifying totally with the spirit. Soul life is a, a lack of identifying with who you really are in Christ. That's why the mind has to be constantly renewed. It has to be changed to think the way your spirit really is. Otherwise, you're walking after the flesh without even knowing it sometimes. Right. It's, just a, it's just a natural reaction because it's where we've lived all of our lives. Right. All right, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. I'm not trying to be heavy tonight. I'm just trying to be real. And sometimes... You know, grace has delivered us. We are righteous in the mind, in the eyes of God. Our spirit is right. But we still got to live in this world. Yes. We're not, we're not going to just I'll fly away today. We, we got to deal with stuff. And because of our, if our minds are not renewed, we're in a struggle here. On the one hand, we are in Christ. And on the other hand, we're walking after the flesh. On one hand, we have this mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And at the same time, we have this ongoing iniquity that's at work because of the soul realm. Right. And it creates double-mindedness and it creates a, a wavering, you know, in faith and everything else. And that's where people struggle all the time. Wondering, what, why won't God do, will God do this for me because, you know, I did this or I said that. It's, it's not having your mind renewed to your true identity so that you can operate from that reality instead of constantly deviating back and forth from one to the other. So, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All right, if you could drop to chapter 4 here and verses 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. 
every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now look at the, look at the way, this, there's a reason for language being language. I know we bastardize everything in the United States. We've got so many slang words, we don't know what we're saying half the time. But there's a reason for things being said the way they're said. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, even now already is it in the world. So any spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh... Now, we know that Jesus came in the flesh 2,000 years ago. And we're sh sure that he's going to come again at some point. But it doesn't say any spirit that confesses not that he has come or will come in the flesh. It says that any spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come. There's the battle. Praise the Lord. So what is your spirit confessing? Not your mouth, because we can say whatever we've been told to say. Do you see what I'm saying? What is your spirit saying? Jesus is coming you? Or is it not confessing that? Now, I'm going to just go a little bit further tonight than I, I debated about, but I'm going to do, you, got, you all can deal with this, praise the Lord. You're, all, you're, you're not babies, okay? Romans 8, verses 8 through 11. Romans 8, 8 through 11. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. We've already talked about this resurrection thing, but the Spirit life because of righteousness. Resurrection life. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. All right. Romans 12 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God so that you can be a revelation of Christ. Not just everybody else, but you need it as much as anybody. If you don't have it, you can't give it to somebody else. Praise the Lord. Resurrection life. Not what we've been saved from, but what we've been saved to. Resurrection life. The life of Christ. A life of Christ lived in us. Paul said, I... I I'm buried with Christ. I am dead. Yet I live. But yet it's not me that lives, but it's Christ in me. Amen? All right, so let's just go a little bit further. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And I'll show you, in my opinion, and based on things that I've read and studied, how we have dumbed everything down to human ways of looking at things when this word is spirit and life so in Ecclesiastes uh, 3 verses 17 and 18 he said I said in my heart God shall judge the righteous and the wicked for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they are themselves beasts God's going to judge the wicked, but he's also bringing them to a revelation that they can see themselves as beasts. Without the regeneration of God, man is a beast. Look around you. Praise the Lord. He has a beast nature. And that, you, that can't be denied. There's some good dogs and there's some bad dogs but they're still all dogs if you understand what I'm saying it's a beast nature that causes people to do the things that they do that to, to create the havoc and the fear and the stress and the pain and the suffering and everything else okay that's the nature unless you're born again now this doesn't get born again 
So it still has some beast nature in it. It has instincts, you might say, that always want to fall back to the old safety net, to the way that it always operated before. Even though who you really are is righteous, holy, just like Jesus. All right? Romans 7, verse 15. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. I won't read, I'm just going to read this one verse for the sake of time. But we, you, if you've read it, Romans 7, you know what we're talking about. When I want to do good, I do bad. I try to do better, the harder I try to be good, the worse I am. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would do, or would, that do I not. But what I hate, that's what I end up doing. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Praise the Lord. This is not before he was born again. This is after the fact. Because he goes on to say, thank God for Jesus Christ in, in chapter 8. Because without him, we're all beasts. But there is no condemnation now. But there's still consequences. So... Praise the Lord. 2 Thessalonians, and I want, let's just read this whole chapter. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the context of, of where I'm speaking from, okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm not sure how many there are in that. 17, yeah. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him that you be not soon shaken in mind or, by, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Because if he isn't revealed, we never do anything about it. That's what Paul was teaching, is he's going to be revealed in you. And that's because if, he, if you don't recognize that, you're never going to do anything about it. You're just going to go on stumbling through, trying to figure out what's going on. So who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God? That's us. We are the children of God. But it opposes that. Or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We are the temple of God. But he tries to exalt himself in the temple to say that I'm God. This thing, this behavior, it rules, right? Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So now this starts to make more sense in the context of what Paul's teaching. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth, with the word of God. The mind being renewed. That's how he gets consumed. With the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, amen, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. We've already known that before the foundation of the world we talked about it. From the beginning chosen you into salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Yes. Belief of the truth is still important. So whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. The beast is not some system. It isn't the universal pricing code. It's not some other system. Colossians 3, 
verses 5 and 6. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. All of that, okay, I get it. it we're talking about sexual sin, but the truth is that is talking about covenant breakers. Now, the result of that might be some physical stuff that goes on, but this is really about breaking covenant with God, not believing, amen, in the covenant that He has made. It makes us fornicators. It makes us adul ad adulterers. We're married to Him, right? So, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. That's the nature of the beast. It doesn't believe God. All right. So, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemies. Now, I, I'm not going to take the, all the time to do this, but the sea represents people. It's symbolic of people. So does the sand. So out of the people, out of people rise up this beast, this beast nature. It's not Gorbachev. Right. It's not Hitler. They had the beast nature and it was exemplified maybe in their lives, but they're not the Antichrist. Right. They're a human who didn't recognize their beastliness. Right. Okay? All right. James 1 and 6. I talked about this just briefly in passing in a message here a few weeks ago, but not in the same context here. But. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So the sea people, people that come up out of the sea, are double-minded. They, they believe in God, but they also are dominated by their thinking. So they're not in tune, right? Their body has not been quickened to their true identity. All right? Then... James 1 and 6. Uh, that's where we are, right? Okay. That's the sea man, you could say. All right, look at Revelation 12 and 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So we're talking about the sand and the sea. People that are operating in this beast nature. Amen. Revelation 12.12 12 talks about the, the man of the earth, the, the dust. Dust, if you go back to Revelation, is what God created Adam out of. Amen. It's a carnality, and, and the devil goes about on his belly eating the dust, right? Because of the fall, that was one of the that was the curse that was put on him. All right, look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying all of this hocus pocus stuff that we've made that we have believed is keeping us from being who we truly are. From keeping us from being able to, to get beyond our flesh. Or just accepting it, you know. And looking out in the future somewhere, some horrible thing is going to come up out of the sea and devour everybody. It's us, for God. You know, it's humanity. <laughs> that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of the enemy. So, here's, here's the, the same reality here, is that the... Isaac is the heavenly. Ishmael is the earthy. What did it say about Ishmael? He's like a wild ass. He's a beast. Why? Because he, do, he isn't part of the covenant. So you could say the same thing about Esau and Jacob. Jacob had the covenant. Esau sold the covenant out. 
just for something to satisfy himself. They're talking, these are all talking about two natures here. Two, two, they're not just talking about two separate realities. They're talking about two people, even especially with uh, Jacob and Esau, you can see it because they're both, they're, they were, they're twins. And God chooses one who should, have, who should not have been the, the receiver of the blessing, but, but he was a heel grabber. Amen. He says, the scripture says he grabbed the heel of Esau trying to get out ahead of him because he wanted the blessing. And then he deceived his father so that he could get the blessing. He would have gotten it at some point. God, it was God's intent that he would have it. But you could see the dual nature going on there. The, 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 the covenant and then the, the humanity struggling with it. Praise the Lord. The devil comes and says... He, on his belly, he goes about eating the dust of the earth, right? He comes to devour the carnal mind. To control the carnal mind. The double-minded sea dweller. And the sand dweller from which the beast arises. That's, his, that's what attracts him. That's what, that's what puts him on. Gives him access. Alright, Galatians chapter 5. Verses 15 and 16. I'm saying this so that you could go back and you can start looking at these scriptures and see we have nothing to fear. This is all, we, we, you know, we read the 65, first 65 books of the Bible and we see the, the spiritual analogies and metaphors and so on and so forth. Then we get to the book of Revelation and all of a sudden it's like where did this come from? It doesn't fit anything else. It doesn't, doesn't sync with anything else that we've learned. Only because we've projected it all out into some weird fantasy world that has nothing to do with the rest of the Bible. If the first 65 books are a revelation of Jesus Christ, then certainly revelation, which is by definition the revelation of Jesus Christ is about the same thing. It isn't a new thing that we get off into. It's just that everything that we have, have looked at spiritually before, now we're looking at it as if as though it were literal. And there's a literal truth to it, but it's all symbolic. It's all symbolized by the spiritual. And that's what I mean. He says, unless you're willing to look at spiritual things spiritually, you're not going to figure it out. You're not going to understand what's going on. Is it not, isn't that a perfect definition of us? If we don't look at ourselves spiritually, we can't ever figure this thing out because there's always something that isn't matching up with the spirit. But if you bite and devour one another, like a beast, what happens? Take heed that you don't, you're not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's talking about the same thing. If you operate as a beast, you'll destroy yourself. You'll destroy others. So stay in the Spirit. Keep in line with the Spirit. I know it's easier to say this and read it and say, okay, well, there it is. Come on. Because we got this thing that has to be renewed. That's the reason why we come together at church. That's the reason why we read the Scriptures. That's why we confess the Word of God. Not just as a rabbit's foot or some kind of talisman that we can manipulate God. No, so that we can be the people that we've been saved to be. So that we can experience the... The abundant life here on earth, not have to wait until we're dead in the flesh and, and gone to heaven. Come on. Praise the Lord. So, but if you bite and devour. So it's, it's a constant reminder. God wants to renew the nature of people who act like animals. You're an animal. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You can change. Amen. It's... See, the beast's authority is the carnal mind. We, t we, t we say it all the time, we just say it in different ways. The only way he can get to you is through your natural mind. Because your spirit has already whipped him and he knows that he can't mess with you spiritually. He has to come to your carnal mind. He has to come to your natural mind because it's at enmity with God. It won't agree with God. Right? That's what happens when we freak out and do all the crazy stuff that we all do. We haven't identified ourselves as who we truly are, and we yield to that carnal mind, and the devil's right there. And twists it, and 
yeah, how many of you yell, had an argument or a, a, a misunderstanding or whatever, and a few days later you're going, I don't remember what the, that was about. How did that ever get started? You know, it, because it escalates. Once he gets you in the flesh, man, he can rip you ten ways to Sunday because you don't, you don't know what's going on. And then, you know, like I said, I've said this before, but it's true. It's true of me. It's true of all of us. Three days, it is like uh, Sally and I haven't just had a big blow up here. Uh, that's not why I'm preaching this. Although we have had them, praise God. That isn't why I'm doing this. I'm just saying, there's been times when you get into some strife of some kind. It may not be with your spouse. It may be a job. It may be some other derelict, somebody, you know, a neighbor. It could, it could be anybody. And, and it isn't until you're into the mess that you realize, hey, this is a spiritual battle. Because yeah. you don't see the forest for the trees. You're so into it. That by the time you realize that, you're already in up to your neck, and now you've got to figure out how am I going to... Now what? Praise the Lord. The beast's authority is the carnal mind. All right? Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13, 14. I'm about done. I've messed with your heads enough for tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed with the Holy Ghost. We are saved. We are sanctified. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. But there is a reality that we deal with right here on earth that the enemy can still influence if our minds are not renewed to this reality which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory, which is a glorified body. Amen. No more flesh to have to mess with. All right. That's the mind of Christ. We are sealed by the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 16. And this scripture had messed with my mind lots of times over the years. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You can't get it intellectually. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Not the Spirit, right? The Spirit knows right from wrong. It can judge between good and evil, right? And it can't be judged because it's already been judged and declared righteous. All right? For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But the scripture also in another place, Paul says, put on the mind of Christ. You have it. We have it. But we got to put it on. And you, the way you do that is by renewing your mind. That's what's so important. I think we miss it sometimes about confession. Confession is simply saying what God says. It isn't, it isn't a gimmick. It isn't a, you know, some people think that's all it is. Oh, it's just, a, you know, you're just trying to get something for yourself. No, man. I mean, that's, what, that's how I am able to speak the thoughts of God. That's how I'm able to know what God is thinking about the situation. So I, if I don't confess it, if I confess it, the more I confess it. Just think, when you were a kid, I don't know how it was for you, uh, things may have changed, but when I was a kid going to school, they used to have these flashcards. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. 8 plus 8 is 16. On and on and on. Then they go to multiplication and division. Over and over and over and over and over until it becomes so natural that you don't have to start counting on your fingers. Amen. You don't have to you know, count on the points of the number to figure out what it is. It's instinct. It's natural because it's been so inbred into your thinking, into your way, into your mind, that it's a natural reaction. Four plus four, eight. Right? And so, and, and, and even more abstract uh, problems become less abstract because you kind of get it. You know, you just kind of your mind starts working that direction, that way. It's able to, to, to resolve the conflict, right? That's what the Word of God is supposed to do. That's what renewing our mind is supposed to do, resolve the conflict. 
so that we can lay hands on the sick, so that we are a true representation of God. But here's the deal. Unless that man of sin is revealed, we'll never do anything about it. We just go on stumbling through life wondering why God isn't doing this and why isn't that happening and why isn't this happening. That's the purpose for this, not to make us feel weird or ashamed or anything. We're saved. We're sealed. We have the earnest of our inheritance. But how do we want to live in this life? How do we want to influence others? How do we want to be a revelation of Jesus? I, I told Sally, I said, you know, look, his visage was so marred that he couldn't be recognized. Well, when we're not accurately <coughs> revealing him, we're marring his image. People aren't seeing him as he truly is. He's altogether lovely. Right? But he isn't altogether lovely to a lot of people because we have represented him in a way that isn't that lovely. Right. He's bad. He's going to get you. He's after you. And, you know, and that's why he tells us we have been reconciled to God. So be ye therefore reconcilers. How were we reconciled? By the grace of God, by the goodness of God, by the love of God. Amen. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll quit with this. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. So I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. We're not talking about natural armies here. Right. We're talking about demonic spiritual warfare. He is the Word of God. Out of His mouth comes the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Amen. That it should smite the nations, shall rule them with a rod of iron. He that treadeth the winepress, the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And He hath on His vesture and on His thigh the name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come! Gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, uh, I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. The beast is dominating these men. These earth men, these natural way of thinking people, amen. And he sets on the horse. He that was on the horse comes against him, against this army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, which is... I, I, well, I'm not going to go into all that. But this, the mark of the beast is simply, it's supposed to be in your forehead and on your right hand. Or on your hand, right? Well, Jesus has sealed us in our head. We have the mind of Christ. This is just somebody that doesn't have that. The mark is the mark of man, the fallen nature of man, the beast. Amen. And it's the way he thinks. And the way you think is the way you act. And your hand represents your actions, your, your, your works. Okay? So the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and with him he deceived them that he had, had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him, the word of God, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The word of God, not literal armies, because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God would have to contradict himself for that to be anything other than that. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The strongholds are any area in our lives that have not submitted to the Spirit. The strongholds are the things that Sarah talked about. The strongholds are the things that all of us have experienced in our lives. The hurts, the rejections, the pain, the lack of understanding, the, the, the whatever it could be. 
those become strongholds that then try to dominate us even after we are born again. And we experience it. But see, religion tells you, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's all good. How are you doing? I'm blessed. I'm not saying be a whiner. I don't like whiners. But on the other hand, we need to be honest with ourselves. We have battles to fight, but those battles are not with flesh and blood. It's with our carnal mind. Amen? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down the stronghold. I'm telling you, God has given us this revelation of grace. Not, not me. It's everywhere. I mean, we, we, we picked up on what everybody else is doing, right? So I, it's not like I'm trying to corner anything or say, look at me. I got this. No, it's out there because that's what God is doing. Why? Because without that, we can't get to here. And if we don't get to here, we're never going to be a revelation of Jesus. The, the glory of God is never going to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. It has to happen. Some, somewhere along the line, we've got to say, whoa. I've met the enemy, and he is me. You know, he's the flesh. He's the side of me that doesn't want to yield or, or truly be conformed to the image of Jesus. It isn't our works. It's not works. We're saved. We are sealed. We're going to heaven. We've, we've got a, our name on a roll book. But this is more than about us going to heaven or God would have just taken every one of us. Every, the moment we accepted Christ, He would have just zapped us out of here and that had been the end of it. But there's a whole world here of people who are still beasts that God is trying to restore and redeem back to His image. He's wanting a big family. He's wanting to increase the family. Right? Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. I'm done. Thank you, Jesus. Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to, to develop into the people, not through condemnation, not through guilt, not through shame, but by your love. To understand how much you love us, Lord, that you're not judging us, that you're not condemning us. You've accepted us in the beloved. We are your family. We are your adopted. You went out and picked us out and said, I want you. I'm taking you with all of your faults. I love you. And I'm just as you are. Yes. But I want the rest of your life to be blessed. I want the rest of your life to be a, an image of me. A perpetuation of God in the earth. Yes. I want you to experience the abundant life. I want you to know it and live it. Yes. And be a recipient of all the blessings that come through it. Yes. And by it. Amen. God bless all of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Don't let the devil turn this into condemnation and guilt and shame. That's what he'll try to do, but that's not the message. The message is that God so loved the world that he gave. Praise the Lord. And he keeps on giving.